Imagine that you have in front of you a small bundle of wood, a few pieces of fabric and a plate of pulled pork. Your task is to ensure that these objects disappear in such a way that nobody could ever make use of them again. Now, I'm sure we could talk all day about various clever ways of accomplishing this goal, but let's take the most obvious connection which popped into my head. Wood burns, fabric burns, and meat is edible. So, make a little campfire and eat one of the objects while incinerating the other two. Simple, right? Well, apparently not for the characters in the Robert the Doll films, where we've seen five of them realise that the woody, clothy, meaty ghost boy was evil and do nothing to destroy him, despite Robert basically being a spooky walking barbecue set who even carries his own carving cutlery with him. This inability to just kill and eat Robert clearly has a history, as this third film, The Toy Maker, takes place during World War II. And because this is a prequel, we know right away that both Robert and the title character are going to survive since we've seen them both very much alive in the present day. So with all possible stakes removed from the story by the first frame, let's proceed to watch a film where nothing matters. We open with stock footage of Nazis goose stepping around, a squadron of the Luftwaffe in flight, and people giving the Nazi salute to Adolf Hitler. Then we get a caption telling us that our setting is Nazi Germany. You know, in case anyone thought that the footage of Hitler was put in by accident. The title card is immediately followed by two Nazis in Gestapo uniforms with swastikas on them shouting in German as they chase a guy through some woods. Were all of these things really necessary? I'm trying to imagine somebody out there who needed the stock footage, the title, and the sight of guys wearing swastikas before his brain kicked in and he went, Oh, now I understand where this film is set. In case you are that guy, yes, our setting is World War II, though I'm not sure how that fits into the real-life lore which the previous films hovered around. The original Robert was based on the story of how a man called Robert Otto got hold of his allegedly haunted doll, and film 2 was about the rumoured strange events in the museum where the doll is currently displayed. So what's this film based on? As the story goes, in 1941 the real Robert doll would have been gathering dust in a Florida attic. Oh, I see that unlike the previous films, there's no based on a true story on this DVD cover. And according to Andrew Jones, the shift to a 1940s setting was motivated partly by the fact that there was an industry trend for World War II movies going on at the time. I wonder what he would have done if he'd looked around for a bandwagon to jump onto and found that everybody was putting out giant monster movies. I suppose we'd have a film where Robert attacks Swansea after being exposed to toxic waste which made him 50 feet tall. Anyway, the guy being chased by Nazis runs to a farmhouse and begs the family inside to hide him. They do, and the Gestapo eventually fuck off. The fugitive is holding a mysterious book which the Nazis are after and which he claims must not fall into the hands of that mean old Mr. Hitler. The family let the guy stay with them for a couple of days until he can get himself smuggled across the border, but then out of the blue the Nazis come back. And they've brought one of those proper bad Nazis with the black and everything. It's panic stations, so they hide their fugitive in the attic, which always works out fine, but he seems more concerned about taking the book with him. I need the book. There's no time! Are you sure there's no time? Because she seems to be holding on to the book as she's walking behind you and could hand it over without having to slow down. No, there's no time for you to extend your arm and take the object she's currently holding. We must focus all our energy on climbing these stairs to the extent that her arms may as well be vestigial. So the SS officer reaches the house and acts incredibly friendly and cheerful, which I'm sure we can take at face value and isn't sinister at all. He's probably just a really friendly guy. SS McJackboots sits down with the husband and gives him a long drawn out monologue about how he's a human lie detector and always knows when people are telling him naughty fibs. 
Then he goes upstairs to meet the couple's daughter and also gives her a long monologue about lying and how good he is at spotting it. All this winds up being for nothing, however, as the fugitive hiding in the attic gives himself away by knocking something over. The SS officer shoots the fugitive through the ceiling, then has the family executed. They go after the daughter, but find she's gone running over the fields with the book. He fires his little Nazi gun, but only wounds her, and she manages to escape. Some of you might have noticed something a little familiar about this series of events, so let's get that out of the way. The opening of this film involves a cordial SS officer giving a monologue while a fugitive hides in the same house, then ends with the fugitive being shot through a surface and a girl being fired at as she flees across the countryside. The opening of Quentin Tarantino's film Inglorious Bastards also opens with a cordial SS officer giving a monologue while fugitives hide in the same house, then ends with the fugitives being shot through a surface and a girl being fired at as she flees across the countryside. I know what you're thinking, but trust me, it gets worse. In order for this shameless imitation to have taken place, Quentin Tarantino had to have seen the toy maker in 2017 and then used a time machine to return to 2009 so he could use the same ideas in his own film. A fraud you are, Quentin Tarantino, and someday the people shall know of your crimes. The girl with a bullet in her back runs to the building nearest to her parents' remote farmhouse in the Bavarian countryside, which is apparently the toy shop of Amos Blackwood, the creator of evil dolls seen at the end of the previous film. And yes, Amos still looks like he wandered in off the set of Trash Humpers. Hyenas with mouths that go, hey! They want to tort that head, I'll snap that motherfucking neck and dance, dance, dance. At least they managed to get rid of that shininess from the last film's makeup job that made him look like he was wearing somebody else's face inside out, but he still doesn't look even slightly convincing. Hey guys, what are we going to make his eyebrows out of? Oh, don't worry, I've got some stuff in my attic that'll work fine. The girl gurgles at him for a bit about how much the Nazis want the book and then dies. Amos might be the type of person to unleash a bunch of murderous dolls on the world, but he ain't no fascist, so he hides the girl's body and keeps the book hidden. We learn that the toy shop Amos owns is nearly out of business, and so after noticing that the book appears to be full of magic spells, he decides that bringing his products to life would be the best thing to make them stand out. Can you guess what doll he tries the spell out on first? Yep. Because if you're stood there with a book of black magic in your hand wondering which of these dolls am I going to bring to life, you'd obviously pick the one that looks like this. Not these ones, or this innocent looking one. Your first thought would be to see what kind of character lurks behind these eyes. So Robert comes to life and Amos is delighted because clearly the reason why no small child has been interested in buying him before now is because he wasn't animated by dark magic. The next day, he tells the girl who works in his shop all about the magic book he retrieved from a girl fleeing the Gestapo and how he used it to bring his dolls to life. She believes him about as much as she should, but a short while later, Robert tries to kill her with a pencil. Luckily, as we've seen previously, he's really shit at murdering, and even with the element of surprise on his side, he isn't able to harm the girl in any way. Amos intervenes and tells Robert off for being an evil murderous toy. This is Abigail. She is our friend. Do you understand? <laughs> now give me that pencil. I've, look what you've done to her. Naughty boy. Though this kind of contradicts an explanation given by a psychic in the previous film about Robert's background. I spoke to a psychic, okay, and she, she claimed a, a male energy connected to Agatha. He encouraged the evil inside Robert. I think this might be the third time that a psychic has been wrong in these films, because despite claiming that Amos encouraged Robert to be evil, here he is discouraging stabbing people in the face with stationery. 
They might have noticed this contradiction, however, as while Amos is calming the girl down following her brush with being briefly inconvenienced, they discuss what might have made Robert into such an angry little nutter. Amos suggests that it could, possibly, maybe, perhaps, be because the doll belonged to a boy who was murdered by his father and the kid's angry spirit passed into the toy when he died. Yeah, I suppose that would explain it. Robert doesn't seem to hate Amos, however, as Amos has been showing Robert a lot of care and consideration since owning him. I purchased the doll. I, I remodeled his face. I reinforced the limbs. You remodeled the face? Really? Because you did a terrible job. Did you add the cataract on purpose or was that part of his original design? I suppose if there's one thing little girls love playing with, it's dolls with realistically degenerating eyes. Amos' shop assistant decides that this is more than she signed up for and announces that she'll be quitting immediately. Uh, hang on. A character in this franchise has learned that Robert is dangerous and her first reaction is to leave and never come back. We can't let that kind of common sense go unrecognised. Let's give her a hand, folks. Amos is saddened by her decision to run for the hills and concludes that the best solution to his new loneliness will be more spooky living dolls. He brings two of his own creations to life, Otto because the only thing more cliched than a possessed doll is a possessed clown doll, and Isabel because what other spooky girl doll film never heard of it, shut up, fuck you, shut up. We then rejoin the cheery SS man who's been trying to track the book down since the opening scene. He's just got a lead on its whereabouts thanks to none other than Shop Girl who heard about an offer of reward money for any information and decided to betray Amos. But then the Nazis betray her right back so she wasn't all that smart, but at least she knew when to cut and run from the killer doll so let's give her another hand! <laughs> If only Amos hadn't told the girl everything about how Robert came to life, including the part about retrieving the book from a girl who was on the run from the Nazis. He could easily have left that part out and made something up instead of trusting her with the very information that would lead the Nazis to his shop. But anyway, he leads the Nazis to his shop and they capture him. They leave somebody behind to burn the place down, but would you believe it, the creepy dolls who live there kill the guy. Specifically, Robert bonks him on the head with a bat, which you might recall didn't work out too well when he tried it in 2015, so we have to assume this guy survived and went on to live a long and happy life until his son murdered him in the bath. We visit the scary Nazi torture dungeon where Amos has been taken and get a drawn out scene where the SS guy is torturing him. But Robert and the other dolls have made their way to the Nazi headquarters to stage a rescue. I was a little sceptical about how a doll with the mindset of an angry child would be able to interpret the Nazi power structure enough to find their base, especially given that he's only been alive for a couple of days. But I suppose you make yourself easy to track down when you hang swastikas all over everything you own, so never mind. There's a scene where a Nazi follows a weird noise and gets killed, followed by a scene where a Nazi follows a weird noise and gets killed. Now, the first guy I've got no problem with. He was in a dark room and his throat was cut before he knew any killer dolls were around. But then there's this fucker. We've seen quite a few characters in these films sit there gawping at Robert while he walks up and kills them and every time it gets stupider to look at, with this being the prime example. In film one we had Jenny sitting on her arse and crying as Robert walked towards her. That you can kind of explain. She's a housewife with mental health problems, so her coping mechanisms likely aren't the best. Plus, there might be a sort of Lovecraft response going on where the first sight of something paranormal is such a shock to look at that the mind can't cope and react by going insane. Then in film two, we had the museum owner lying around going, Aah! while Robert bore down on him. 
That's not so easy to explain. He had already seen Robert running around killing people, so he wasn't getting any sudden shock that could paralyze him with fright. Factor in the fact that he had a fucking gun in his hand and the only excuse you can make for him is that he wasn't expecting to be attacked from the rear and was just too surprised to react properly. But then there's this Nazi prick. He sees one of the dolls and isn't scared, just angry. He has a gun which he uses to try and kill the doll. He's a fully trained soldier who's creeping around a room expecting an attack to come. And when it does... Of course, there's a good reason why characters turn into gibbering wrecks whenever Robert gets near them, I know that. The reason is Robert is fucking shit. They have to use all these close shots for the deaths in order to prevent the audience realising that they're watching a fully grown adult be terrorised by something this size. If the camera pulled back any, it would be painfully obvious that the Nazi could send the doll flying with one half arsed kick. And if you have to work an unofficial rule into your film that victims suddenly become incapable of moving or responding while staring at something which is going to kill them, then why bother making Robert a murderous doll who stabs people? Why not film the terrifying adventures of Robert the perfectly ordinary doll, but the rule is that everybody who sees him has to stand there gawping at him until they starve to death. You may as well, it wouldn't be any more ridiculous than these characters who only die because if they could move one limb they'd be able to hold their attacker at bay until help arrives. <sighs> what an inconvenient time to forget all my combat training! Fuck off! We return to the torture chamber where the Nazi is preparing to execute Amos and we see that Amos has developed a cataract in the three minutes since we last saw him. Note that this cataract in his right eye isn't to be confused with the cataract in his left eye which was there at the end of the previous film. Anyway, I'm going to shoot you. Doll stabbed the nuts. Doll stabbed to everywhere. Then kablamo. The Nazi is dead but Amos has been shot during the struggle and dies. Luckily the dolls use one of the spells from the book to bring him back to life. The film ends with a strange, pointless scene of Amos on a train platform waiting for a train and then the train comes and they get on the train and then it's the end. I'm not sure why they ended there. Maybe they wanted to show that Amos got away from the Nazis, but a bigger question would be how he got out of the Gestapo headquarters in the first place. I mean, were there only those three guys running the whole building? The end credits are filled with more stock footage of Nazis to clear up any confusion that might be lingering about where and when this film is set, and we're assured that Robert will be back in yet another film in which he will have his revenge. If I had to give the Toymaker a serious rating, it would probably be... Uh... It's definitely a low effort kind of production, but it doesn't have quite the cobbled together feel of the second film. A fair bit of work goes into outlining the character's motivations, and we even get a character who behaves in a sensible way which the audience can relate to, Nazi betrayal notwithstanding. The special effects have definitely improved, not that there was much of a standard. Though the dolls still walk by bobbing around like Thunderbird puppets, and they couldn't even be bothered to craft a second hand for shots of Robert holding something. How is that knife staying in place? Is it glued there? Does that mean in the film's world Robert has to glue a tiny knife to his hand before he goes out murdering? See, these are the questions you end up with when you spend your entire effects budget making a man wear his own weight in liquid latex. The only thing I can really talk about positively is maybe the performance of the guy playing the SS captain. The whole charming, smiling, evil, bastard Nazi character has been done before, but unoriginality aside, I thought it was at least done well, particularly in the interrogation scene. Overall, Robert and the Toymaker is pretty bland and forgettable. Much like the first instalment, if it was a standalone film, it wouldn't be interesting enough to be worth making a video about. But of course, it's not a standalone film. It's part of a franchise. Which brings me to the fact that we only have one film left to go. 
In the next video, we'll be looking at the fourth and final part of the series, The Revenge of Robert, and examining... <laughs> Oh, no!